my presentation I might mention is a little bit different than what's in the packet, I believe. Uh, that, that's an older version, I think. Anyway, so, uh, but it's basically along the same, same uh, thought process, I suppose. Um, a little overview of the presentation today. Um, water, the history of water law and water right basics. And we'll get into each of those. Uh, they say that half of education is learning the lingo. And so hopefully um, you'll learn a few, uh, a little bit of the lingo today and, and uh, increase your vocabulary. Um, and, and also gain an appreciation for the history of Utah water law, um, which fascinates at least me. Um, first of all, how many here are water users? Just show of hands. It's a trick question. Um, I, I guest lecture occasionally at Utah State University and, and it's interesting asking that question and having the students there think about the question and, and so we're all water users in, in one form or another as humans. Um, appropriators, um, the definition of an appropriator is one who takes possession or pro appropriates from the whole. Let's see here. Oops, here we go, history of water. Native Americans were the first uh, known uh, water users, community ditches dug by American Indians were used to divert or put water to use in the arid southwest. Uh, the religious and military outposts of the Spanish also required a stable supply of water. They sometimes used the canals of Native Americans and sometimes dug their own. Thus the Spanish and Mexican settlers who established missions Agricultural pueblos and military posts were also early water users. Among the later Anglo settlers of the West, Mormon pioneers have been identified as early appropriators of water. The pioneers began using water upon arrival. Um, water was diverted for irrigation of crops and for consumption because precipitation alone would not be adequate. At the time, there was no government or laws other than their own religious organization, which might I, I might add, it was substantial. They had to make decisions to fit their environment and as equitably as possible, create a system to supply water to users. First of all, it was quite evident that the, the West was a desert and from their decisions, the pro, prior appropriation doctrine evolved and replaced riparian water law. During the same period that pioneers were settling the Great Basin, gold was discovered in California. Mining, particularly of placer claims, required the diversion of large amounts of water from rivers and streams, and the miners applied the tenants of mining law to water use. As I've prepared my presentation today, I, I wanna share with you um, a couple books that I find um, quite instructional uh, as, as, as you uh, learn about water law. Um, this, this book is uh, entitled an, an Historical Overview of the Evolutions of Institutions Dealing with Water Resource Use and Water Resource Development in Utah, 1847 through 1947. It's by John Harvey Swenson and was a master's thesis at Utah State University and has been published in, in by, uh, by the Department of Natural Resources and, and really is, is quite insightful and not too thick to read. Also, uh, I, I refer and have learned much from, from this book, The Utah Law of Water Rights. Uh, it was written by Hutchins and Jensen and both, both of these uh, these uh, publications provide a historical background to our discussion today. The Mormon settlement of Utah was entirely dependent on diversion of water for irrigation. They were the first Anglo-Saxons to practice irrigation on a large scale in the United States. Mormon pioneers have been called the fathers of irrigation in America, but were not the first to irrigate and use 
to irrigate land in the West. As I mentioned, the Catholic missions in California and New Mexico, for example, had been irrigating their orchards and vineyards long before the Mormons settled in Utah in 1847. Several years prior to the arrival of the pioneers to the Salt Lake Valley, some of the first settlers in Oregon had been using small ditches to irrigate their crops. And at the time of the, of the settlement in Salt Lake Valley, Indians in southern Utah were raising crops with the aid of irrigation. While on an expedition to southern Utah, Parley Pratt wrote about the existence of irrigation ditches used by Indians living along the Santa Clara River. So it would be more correct to say that the pioneers significantly influenced modern irrigation law, namely the theory of beneficial use as part of the doctrine of prior appropriation and should be credited to elevating irrigation to something of a science. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, to you riparian doctrine versus prior appropriation doctrine as, as to give you an understanding of, of uh, basic water law. Riparian doctrine is a system for allocating water that was used in the Eastern United States, which gives owners of land a right to use a reasonable amount of water as it crosses their property. The Eastern United States, um, generally wetter, and, uh, and had less need for water, and, and that was their uh, basis of water law. Harvey, in, in his master thesis, quoting Morton Hor Horwitz, said, it was obvious to the Utah settlers that the riparian doctrine of English common law used in the eastern United States, which gave water rights only to lands adjacent to the streams, was not suited to farming and it was promptly discarded. Uh, prior appropriation doctrine is a system for allocating water used in most western states. First in time is first in right means that the first person to take a quantity of water and put it to beneficial use has a higher priority than a subsequent user. The, de the development of laws governing water rights in the United States was markedly different than in the East. The most important reason for this was the difference in climate and geography. In the East, precipitation is relatively abundant. Water courses are numerous and generally close to areas where water is needed. In most of the West, the opposite is true. Relatively slight precipitation means fewer water courses. This increases the necessity to divert water to areas of use. The doctrine of prior appropriation, which is currently used as the foundation of the water rights system in every western state, developed to respond to arid conditions. As we talk about um, east versus west, it's often uh, delineated by the hundredth meridian. And on this slide, that blue line that I've drawn uh, through from uh, Canada through Texas is the hundredth meridian and is based on a precipitation of greater than 20 inches per year. The concepts of prior appropriation of water, which developed in the California mining camps, spread to other western states as mineral discoveries led California miners to other states. A basic principle of mining law was that the miner who initially staked a claim, who is first in time, is protected in development of the claim against other miners. His is first in right. This practice carried over to the use of water and became not only recognized as tradition, but also protected in courts of law. Congress took a fundamental step in deference to state and territorial water law with the passage of the Mining Act of 1866. Under this law, Congress confirmed water rights for mining, agriculture, and other uses that had been acquired by private parties on public lands under local customs, laws, and court decrees. This result was obtained even though many appropriators were trespassers on federal land. 
The first appropriative water rights statute was passed in California in 1872. It allowed for creation of such rights by posting at the point of diversion a document stating the intended amount of the right and its purpose of use, filing for the right in the county recorder's office where the right was located and taking the steps necessary to perfect the water right to put it to beneficial use with, quote, due diligence. Also important in the law was that rights established could be lost through non-use. In the Desert Land Act of 1877, Congress declared that the right to use water in the Western US by claimants under the act must depend upon bona fide prior appropriation. The US Supreme Court held that the effect of the Desert Land Act was to sever title of the water from the public land. Congress directed that rights to use water be established under state and territorial law separately from land ownership claim, claims. As documented by Harvey, again, and others, the institution set place to administer the prior appropriation doctrine in Utah evolved over time. Interestingly enough, ecclesiastical courts were sometimes used to settle early local disputes over, on the simple basis of just what looked like justice. The 1852 territorial legislature authorized county courts and vested water rights. In 1865, irrigation districts were instituted by the territorial government. Throughout the West, state governments began to realize that a central administrative system to control appropriative water rights, as well as a centralized office of reg record keeping for such rights would be preferable to the haphazard administration which occurred under the early statutes. Therefore, water right laws most often regulated at a state level <coughs> rather than a local or federal level. Wyoming was the first among the states to giving a state agency a major role in administrating appropriate water rights. The key features of the Wyoming system were one, the requirement <coughs> that an application must be filed with a state entity before a right could be created. Two, the necessity of ruling on an application by the state agency, including denying a permit where no water was available. And three, the maintenance of a central bank of public records containing applications which had been made. Wyoming's first surface water laws were enacted in 1875. More comprehensive laws were adapted, adopted along with the state constitution in 1890. Although Western states embraced the doctrine of a prior appropriation, each state adopted laws and policies to best administer water within their state. Utah became a state in 1896 and its water statute was enacted in 1903. In some ways, the traditional appropriation doctrine incorporated public values. A fundamental tenet of prior appropriation law was that land and water estates were separate and that water could be removed from its natural location and used beneficially elsewhere. This facilitated the public purpose of making an inhabitable, inhabitable region out of arid lands. Also, there were preferred uses under the traditional appropriative law, which embodied a public sentiment that domestic, municipal, and agricultural needs should be met before water could be put to other uses. The Utah pioneers under the leadership and vision of Brigham Young's Commonwealth enlisted a cooperative effort under mutual irrigation companies that embodied their public interests. The prior appropriation doctrine as enacted in the state of Utah contains some key points. First, water must be diverted and put to beneficial use. 
Second, to uphold the principle of, of prior appropriation, first in time, first in right, all water rights have a priority date associated with them. As we get into the management of, of various basins, priority date uh, will become of major importance. Third, a water right can be lost by either abandonment or forfeiture. Abandonment is determined by the intent of the water user and does not require a statutory time period. A water right can be lost by forfeiture if the right is not used for seven years. In summary, regarding prior appropriation doctrine, this graph illustrates the concept of distribution based on priority. In this example, the first priority is an 1879, 1873 priority and is the red line at the base of this hydrograph. Uh, the second priority is the 1922 priority and still has water through a significant portion of the year. The third priority is the 1949 and only takes water during high spring flows. These are typically uh, reservoirs or other rights that store water uh, during uh, higher flow periods. But this priority uh, concept as, as again in summary should be understood to be moderated by reality and beneficial use. Speaking of absolute priority, again in Harvey's uh, thesis, uh, quoting Morton Horwitz, he said, at the same time because all set, and this is referring to again, historical evolution of Utah's water law, at the same time because all settlers were members of the same religious order that had come to establish new cooperative communities, the Mormons could agree that no users or group of users should be allowed to enjoy exclusive rights to water to the disadvantage of other users in similar circumstances. Thus, while Utahns adopted a system of appropriation in place of repairing rights, they de-emphasized the absolute priority of use. Beneficial use was decided to be the basis, the measure, and limit of a water right, and no man could gain a right to more than he could use in a beneficial manner. So thus, while Utahns pioneered mutual irrigation companies, they also introduced the concept of water turns, water masters uh, of those mutual irrigation companies and shares in the, in the companies and the importance of beneficial use. With that, um, with that uh, historical background, we'll, we'll now fast forward to, uh, to the present and how the Division of Water Rights administers water rights. Um, through the state engineer and the state engineer's office, which is the Division of Water Rights. Willard Young was the first state engineer and his initial duties were to aid in planning, design, and construction of water storage and conveyance facilities. Kent Jones is our current state engineer who you met this morning and director of the Division of Water Rights. As you can see, he's quite a friendly guy. Here is a, a, a division, a simplified division organization chart that shows the state engineer, deputy state engineer, and assistant state engineers over uh, different areas, distribution, technical services, appropriation, dam safety, and adjudication. And then there are regional offices scattered throughout the state. Um, but one, one point that I'd like to make is even with this organization chart, it should be clearly understood that the division doesn't make water and actions on water rights do not make more water. Water rights only uh, establish who gets to use the available water. While I'm on this slide, there's a few things to note. Again, these, these regional offices, Logan, Vernal, Price, Richfield, Cedar City, and two here in, our, in Salt Lake over the Weber and the Utah Lake areas. And this map shows how those regions are divided. 
generally along uh, drainage basins. Out west, it's, it's more uh, county and geography that determine this. And, and like I say, there are seven regional offices. And within these regions, as you'll see on these maps, there are two digit numbers. Um, these two digit numbers are the first two numbers in every water right in that area. For example, Cache County, uh, area 25 is, is one that I deal with. Weber is area 57 and 59. Uh, did I get that wrong? 35, okay. Where there is no major system such as the West Deserts, the boundaries follow geologic features creating drainages. Application numbers differ from, from uh, water right numbers and they, they are assigned to applications sequentially by application type. So application numbers that begin with a letter, capital letter A are for applications to appropriate a small a for change applications, a capital D for diligence claims, a capital U for underground water claims, a capital F for fixed time applications, a capital T for temporary uh, applications to appropriate, and a small t for temporary change applications. Getting into, into some of the basics of water law, in uh, in 1903, the legislature passed water laws that required new uses of water to be obtained by filing an application to appropriate with the state engineer. Surface water uses in place prior to 1903 were recognized as valid and referred to as diligence claims. Either way, a water right must be established if water is diverted and put to use. In 1936, the law was amended to include underground water claims or wells. Um, rights to use of water are not obtained simply because water exists upon or beneath property or passes over it. Such rights would be riparian and not recognized under Utah law. Speaking of Utah law, you'll find our are Utah laws, uh, water laws under Title 73 of the Utah Code. The basic and fundamental codes uh, start with 73-1-1. All waters in this state, whether above or under the ground, are hereby declared to be the property of the public as represented by the state. 73-1-2, standard units of measurement of water. Flow is in cubic feet per second. Volume is in acre feet. 73-1-3, again states that beneficial use shall be the basis, the measure, and the limit of all rights to the use of the water in the state. And then 73-1-4 refers to reversion to the public by abandonment or forfeiture of non, for non-use within seven years. So what is a water right? These are the elements of water right. Ownership, priority, quantity of water, storage, points of diversion, uses, amount of use, period of use, and place of use. Each of these uh, are, are unique elements of a water right. Clearly, uh, by, by definition, a water right is owned by an entity or an individual and has a priority date, as I've mentioned, and it's quantified by either a flow rate and a volume or both. Um, and, and it's storage if water is stored. Uh, point of diversion is critical as far as where the water is located and the uses we've talked about. Irrigation, domestic, stock water, mining, municipal, et cetera. And the amount of that use. Clearly irrigation is the number of acres, domestic the number of homes, and so forth. As we talk about water rights, again, helping you with your lingo, a lot of people will come in and talk water shares versus water rights and use the two, uh, two words interchangeably. But there is a difference between a water share and a water right. A water share 
is a proportional interest in a water company, such as a mutual irrigation company or so, et cetera, that holds a water right and distributes water to its shareholders. As opposed to a water right, as we have discussed, is a recognized right to divert water from a source for a beneficial use and may be held by an individual, an irrigation company, an agency, a corporation, a uh, state agency, a uh, federal government can hold water rights, a uh, uh, municipality can hold water rights. More details about water rights and a pointed version. Is it a surface pointed version, a single location, or a point to point, for example, for a stock watering right? Uh, is it a spring? Uh, these are surface points of diversion. A drain, how is it defined? A well is a certain location. Um, is, and th that all refers to point of diversion. Uses of the water. Uh, is the use a full-time or a part-time? A year-round use or part of the year? Um, is it a sole supply or is it a supplemental? These are all aspects of a water right that you should be familiar with as you deal with your own water right or those you may be interested in. Um, what does sole supply versus supplemental right mean? What is, that? is the water right a sole supply or supplemental right? James got a microphone. Go ahead and ask the question. Is the water right a sole supply or supplemental right? What does that mean? Good question. Uh, sometimes a use has more than one source of supply. Uh, for example, uh, a piece of land that's irrigated by both a, an irrigation company and a private well. And so if it's, uh, if it's supplemental, it has, like I say, more than one source. If it, and therefore we have to determine how much of the, of the use is provided by each of the sources. And so that's how you sole supply between the uses what that, that amount is. Go ahead. So, quick comment on that. So, uh, like, uh, Just a minute, Let, let's get the microphone to you. A spring that feeds a house may provide water for 20 years and they don't need to use their well. And then something happens and they have issues with the spring and so they need to run the well. Now, if the well, if the spring, if the well was a supplemental right to, to subsidize the spring if needed, then is that what we're talking about? That's what we're talking about. And you can't lose that in seven years if I understand correctly. And, and that's getting into more advanced than I'm supposed to be talking about. Somebody else will be covering that, is that correct? And so, anyway, it's a good question and you bring up some complexities of the water rights. And, and so it's not all just black and white uh, recipe book kind of a, a determination. And so th those determinations do need to be um, uh, discovered and, and found out and, and described. So that's a good question. And we'll talk a little bit more about diversion and depletion in just a, a minute here. Priority. Surface rights are frequently regulated by priority. We don't generally um, uh, distribute groundwater rights by priority because of the aquifer and its storage capability. Uh, generally, the priority of a right is the date of filing of the application for an unperfected application or of a certificated filing. The priority of a perfected right is the date of first use for a diligence claim and the date is shown in a decree or on the data on, on the certificate of appropriation. And so perfected just means it's a finalized water right. Ownership, um, you need to be careful on ownership uh, and be certain that the person sell it, selling it actually owns what is being sold and, and you can't always rely on our records. If they're not updated, uh, then, then you need to check with the county recorder to see what, what water rights may be, you may be dealing with in their ownership. When we talk about uh, water right flow and volume, we talk about acre feet. It's a measure of volume. It's a volume one foot deep over an acre of, of, of land. Um, 
flow rate is a volume per time. And so we talk about cubic feet per second. Uh, related to gallons per minute is a, another volume per time. And uh, so a cubic feet per sec foot per second is approximately 450 gallons per minute. And so often people ask, well, how do acre feet and CFS um, convert? And so the answer to that question is to convert acre feet or CFS to acre feet, you have to introduce a time element. So one cubic foot per second over the course of a day, if you do the math, is approximately two acre feet. And so again, there are two different um, quantities. One is a volume, one is a volume per time. And that's, that's how you, how you uh, figure that. Beneficial use. We keep coming back to uh, beneficial use. It's a bedrock um, principle of water law and is the purpose to which water is diverted under a water right. Um, beneficial uses include irrigation, stock watering, domestic use, commercial, industrial, municipal uh, uses. So how much does it take for each of these uses? Uh, it, here's another word for your vocabulary, duty of water. The duty is an estimate of the amount of water reasonably required for specific purposes such as irrigation or domestic use. Common, uh, the duty of common uses, domestic use is considered to be 0 0.45 acre feet per residence or 0.25 acre feet for part-time residents, such as a cabin. This number is based on, on uh, drinking water standards of 400 gallons per residence per day. Uh, and so you do the math and it's 0.45 acre feet. Stock watering is considered to be 0 0.028 acre feet per animal unit. Um, which, is which is 25 gallons per day per animal unit. And so uh, again, irrigation typically ranges from three acre feet to, to six acre feet, depending on where you are in the state and is, is uh, related to um, climatological factors and is uh, typically quite generous based on uh, alfalfa as an index crop. Question right here, James. Your domestic and irrigation are both on an annual basis, is that right? Go ahead. The domestic and irrigation are both annual numbers? That's correct. Where the stock watering gives it per day? Well, no, the stock watering, the 0 .028 is an annual number, and it's, there, it's based on 25 gallons per day, and you do the math, again, multiplying it out, and, and that's how you get that number. Diversion versus depletion. Question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, just real quick on that cabin thing. If, say you own a cabin and that becomes your primary residence over time, do you have to apply to get that 0.45? So the question is, I mean, some ca people live in their cabins year round. And so, so you can get a year round domestic use for a cabin. I mean, we're not gonna judge your house as far as <laughs> big or small, but if you want a year-round primary residence, it's the 0.45 acre feet, and so there are cabin areas that have year-round uses. Okay, any other quick questions here? Okay. Diversion versus depletion. Diversion is the removal of water from its natural source, whether it's surface or groundwater, and applied for its beneficial use. It can be limited by flow or by volume. And again, examples of diversion there are these numbers that I've, we've talked about, diversion for domestic, 0.45 acre feet per home, and livestock, 0 0.028 acre feet per equivalent livestock unit, and irrigation, again, acre feet per acre to pay, based on duty. Depletion is the portion of water withdrawn from a source that is consumed by a particular use and does not return to a natural water source or other body of water. Um, this is where we get into efficiencies. Domestic use is, is commonly uh, 
described as 20% depletion. So you do the math and 20% of 0.45 acre feet is 0 0.09 acre feet per residence. Livestock use is considered to be 100% depletive and irrigation use is commonly 50% depletive. And so that, that, that gives you an understanding of diversion and depletion. The important part of this is as you file change applications, you can't increase either diversion or depletion from historic uses. So here's, a, here's an example of diversion and depletion. 10 acres irrigated with a, and, and a home and 10 head of livestock near Logan. I'm from Logan. And so Logan has a duty of four acre feet per acre for irrigation. And so if you do the math, the 0.45 acre feet for one domestic, 10 horses is 0.28 acre feet. 10 acres of irrigation times four acre feet per acre is 40 acre feet, giving a grand total of 40.73 acre feet. The depletion for these same uses is again, 20% for domestic, 0 0.09. Um, that should be 10 horses, my typo. Uh, 10 horses at 100% depletion is 0.28 acre feet. And irrigation again at 50% gives you 20 acre feet of depletion. So a grand total of depletion of 20.37. So you see that depletion is, is uh, less than uh, diversion amount. I have a question up here. Why is irrigation at 50% depletion? What, wouldn't it be 100% if you use sprinklers? There's no runoff. Good question. So um, even with sprinkler irrigation, first of all, you're not 100% efficient in your application of, of water. And, and so depletion is related to what transpires off the plant. And again, based on an irrigation duty usually associated with alfalfa. Um, Historically, uh, we didn't have sprinkle irrigation, so, so most of the duties of water are based on flood irrigation. And I know we're converting to sprinkle irrigation, and that's again, advanced water rights that we're probably gonna talk about. Uh, but just to answer your question, uh, most of these duty values, um, at least in my area, for example, were decreed by courts uh, based on the science available and, and uh, climatological data available when the decrees were, were uh, issued. And so, again, four acre feet per acre is quite generous and takes into account canal conveyance losses, flood irrigation efficiencies, and so forth. And so it's a pretty uh, general number. It's not site specific necessarily. It is regionally specific based on the climatological data, but th that's how they came up with that, okay? I have two more questions. So would it be accurate to say then, because these are rights, these are not what you're actually doing. So if you acquire a irrigation right that was historically irrigation that you have the right of 50% depletion. And you know, let's say the guy before you was getting his water through a canal which had 20% losses and then you flood irrigated. And so yeah, the right was based on 50% depletion, but you go to a pressurized irrigation system, you still only have the right to deplete 50% of that right. And so if, you know, you don't have the right to do 100% depletion just because you changed the historical use. So it, the 50% depletion, if I'm correct, is that correct saying it's the right to deplete 50%, it doesn't matter what you're actually doing. That's true. And so, so to follow on that question, uh, even though you have a right to four acre feet per acre, if you, if you talk to the farmers who are pumping out of the river, they'll tell you when they pay the power bill, they're not diverting four acre feet per acre, even though they have the right to. Um, again, it's a generous amount and, and we here in Utah don't get into crop types as f for our water rights. In, in other words, you could be irrigating alfalfa this year and plow the field up and be doing grain next year, which requires less water. And so 
The important part of beneficial use is you're limited to the, the uses, meaning the 10 acres in this instance, and however you want to irrigate it, that's your beneficial use, and that's the limit of your right. And so, yes, you're, you're correct. Question up here. Yeah, back to the, the, the uh, change application. Now, you said during the change application process, you can't change the depletion? You can't increase or enlarge the water right by increasing the, the depletion, depletion, which leads me into my next slide right here. But just to follow up on that one, but you can change the diversion, is that correct? Right, so your, okay. your change application, you can change the diversion point, the place of use, um, the nature of use. And so in this example that I'm giving you, we're changing the nature of use. Um, to a subdivision. And so now instead of 10 acres irrigated, um, and we ha I've shown there the heretofore diversion and the heretofore depletion, those can't increase as you now file this change application. So if you take that 10 acres, subdivide it, and now build additional homes such that you have five homes and 17 head of livestock on that same 10 acre piece, the hereafter diversion now changes to uh, five domestic uses, 17 horses, and 9.5 acres of irrigation. And the total is 40.726 acre feet. So you, you can see that we're still below slightly the heretofore diversion. The hereafter depletion changes and it actually reduces as you go to domestic use, the livestock use, and the irrigation. And so this is, that's why these diversion and depletion are critical in a change application when you're changing the nature of use. Okay, is that clear? So how can you research water rights? Um, our our uh, division has a very good website. I've seen other states' websites, and while they're trying to catch up, ours is ours is continually worked on and improved. And we have a good website. It's waterrights.utah.gov, and water right files are available through that website. Not only can you receive notices of there's search engines, there's ways to search water rights uh, to see what is available, but there's also scanned documents of everything that's happened with a particular water right is scanned and put on the files. And so I encourage you to look at those scanned documents. Sometimes we have difficulty, uh, <clears throat> there's human error in entering values on the database, and so sometimes the database isn't 100% correct. Also, sometimes ownership is not updated through our office. Um, and so, it's particularly with ownership, you should check and check the documents, check the county recorders to make sure that the water right, uh, who, whose, whose ownership of that water right it is. At the Salt Lake office here in this building, uh, we have the hard files, the original files. Those may be viewed in the office only. Also, you can, <clears throat> as far as um, researching water rights, we have the regional offices that I mentioned before. Um, they're there to help. We have an open door policy. In fact, the state law was recently changed that deals with consultations and says that we are now able to provide consultation. Well, newsflash, we've been doing this for years, and so, so um, if you need help researching water right, we have friendly staff available to help you in, in your uh, research. So today I've talked about uh, some new vocabulary. As I summarize here, we've talked about diversion, depletion. We know the difference between a water share and a water right. Uh, we understand acre feet as a volume and CFS as a flow rate often referred to as second feet. We talked about duty of water, beneficial use primarily, prior appropriation doctrine, and repairing rights. And so, are there any questions? This is the highest beneficial use, by the way. Are there any questions that I could entertain? 
Right here. Go ahead. This may be better asked tomorrow, but I'm just wondering how often is forfeiture or a forfeiture process initiated? Uh, where, uh, Excellent question about forfeiture and um, forfeiture has been explicitly <laughs> is, 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 a, is a matter for the courts. And so uh, it takes a court action to forfeit a water right. Um, and you'll learn a little bit later about adjudications, which are actually court, um, court uh, mandated uh, cataloging of water rights. And so, like I say, it takes a court action to do forfeiture. It's not for us to initiate. Is it a common occurrence? Or? Not very common. Okay. Uh, the, the reason why is um, in forfeiture, the, uh, the suing party uh, does not acquire the water right. It only eliminates the competition. So there's, an, uh, there's, there's a benefit to doing it, but, but like I say, it only eliminates the competition. Other questions? Looks like I've stumped everyone, so. I do have one quick question also. Uh, appertaining to the certification test tomorrow, I noticed you gave a good summary and you threw out about 10 terms right back at us. Is that uh, something that, uh, uh, how, I'm looking at this and there's a lot of information here. The question is how do we prepare for that certification if we're planning on that? You might answer that, James. So, I mean, there, there will be questions out of this from that, but it's an open book. You can use your notes. It's not, um, you know, you don't have to memorize all those definitions, but it's a general understanding of having that information, where to find it. Great answer. Okay. All right. Thanks, Will. James. To add what you just said, Will talked about a lot of things, and a lot of those will be talked about again and again over the next two days. Yeah. So we're not through talking about them. We've just started. Be before you step off from the microphone there, we have a question from Moab. Okay. Were all rights prior to 1903 lumped together at 1903 priority date? Yeah. Hello? Um, the answer to that is no, they're not all lumped together at 1903. Um, there are some that have a 1903 priority because that's the best they can do, but, but as we adjudicate water rights, we research and, and uh, scan historical records, and so usually a diligence claim, for example, uh, that's filed, they claim a certain priority, and they hopefully have documentation to back up what that priority uh, is, uh, for example, it could be an 1869 priority, which a lot of stock watering rights up in my area were 1869, or it could be an 1860 priority based on a decree, such as, as the rights on the Logan River are part of uh, uh, the Kimball decree. And many parts of the state have decrees that establish certain priorities. So no, they're not all 1903. Any other questions? <laughs> 